If you've been going around the good old internet looking for the right podcast to fulfill your New York Yankees needs, well, I'll be the first to deliver the good news to you. You have found it. Here on Yapping Yankees with me, your host, Mike Scudero, you and I will be discussing the latest news, takes, and talk throughout the entire Yankee universe. Oh, and there may be some ranting on my behalf. Yeah. Anyway, what do you say we get to it? Let's get to yapping! Well, hello there, my fellow Yankee fans, and welcome to episode 212 of the Yapping Yankees podcast, where we yap about the Yanks and nothing but the Yanks. As always, I am your host, Mike Scudero, here on March 10th, 2024. How are you guys doing today? Another Sunday here, and it is a big one, actually, for a few different reasons, and uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes as to the reason why it is yet another awesome and important Sunday, aside from the fact that baseball is still on our televisions, of course, even if it is exhibition does not matter, it's on our TVs, that is what matters, but if you'll allow me to get serious for a second, I actually want to start the show on a different sort of note. And if you're a regular listener of Yapping Yankees, you probably know who I'm talking about. But I actually wanted to start the show on a different note than usual. I wanted to show some love to a friend. And this friend, I originally met him on Twitter some years ago, I believe. It's tough to remember exactly when because I've been on Twitter since 2016, 17, I think 17. I can't even remember now, but it's been years So it's tough to pinpoint when exactly I might have met any one particular person. But nonetheless, he has been a good friend to me on there for some years now. And he even came to be a regular listener and fan of Yapping Yankees, listening every week and even interacting each week on the social media segment. You might have heard me mention his name before, Spencer at Musician DMD. I wanted to give Spencer a shout out today and show him and his family some love. Because Spencer recently had something really bad happen in his life. I'm not going to go too far into detail or shed too much light on it from what I was able to gather from watching his videos when he was telling the world about it. Because while everything I know is really public knowledge out there, I don't want to maybe reveal something that maybe somebody else doesn't know yet that maybe they don't want someone to know. I just want to be as respectful as possible of their wishes and Spencer's recovery. I wanted to show some love for him and... Basically, the short story is what seems to have happened to him as of this last week, week and a half, if I have that correct. I didn't want to pry too much, so I didn't ask much of any questions, really. But it would appear that there was some sort of autoimmune issue with his body that caused him to suddenly lose most of or all of his eyesight. Now, this is absolutely terrible. I could not imagine going through something like that myself. And... He posted some videos about it on Twitter to everyone who follows him and all of his friends and all that, and obviously asking for thoughts and prayers, which is totally understandable. Um, I could not imagine what it's like to have something like that happen to you. Just beyond terrible. And aside from being a regular Yapping Yankees listener and a friend of mine, uh, Spencer is objectively, I can tell you right now, if you don't already follow him or haven't interacted with him yourself, he is a good dude. He's a really good guy. He's got a very beautiful family. He always shows them on social media, them going to Yankee games together, them watching sports together, so on and so forth. I've seen much of it through the years. He is certainly, really almost no one deserves this, something like this to happen to them, but Spencer is certainly one of those people who beyond does not deserve something like this. And I just wanted to show him some love here on Yapping Yankees and extend his request to send him as many thoughts and prayers of yours as possible. I know I have the last few days. He has been very much in my thoughts. Good friend, loyal listener, even better person. So everybody just keep Spencer in your thoughts and prayers. And I know he's probably listening to this because I was blown away by this because I was fortunately able to get a message out to Spencer through his wife because I was able to leave a comment underneath one of his videos and then sent him a DM or his account a DM and I hadn't known who was running his account at the time and telling him who was sending him messages or leaving replies underneath the posts that they were putting on to the timeline and it wasn't until after I DM'd and I actually got an answer unbelievably from his wife and she had actually told me in her response that he had still listened 
to yapping Yankees six days ago on Monday in the hospital while this was all going on to him, he was still listening to my podcast. I can't tell you what that means to me in words. I I really can't. Um, it's unbelievable. I can't imagine what I'd be doing if I were in his shoes, but it would appear that, of course, while I'm sure he and his family are very scared and very uneasy about this surreal situation going on, I mean, he still has it in him to listen to my podcast, of all people, me. I mean, who the heck am I? <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, just unbelievable. So, Spencer, if you're listening to this one as well, which I'm sure you are, um, thank you does not even begin to scratch the surface, dude. It really just doesn't. My thoughts and prayers as well as everyone else's, whether they knew about the situation, if they follow you or have interacted with you in the past already, whether they're hearing about this from me for the first time or they already know about it, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this are sending you thoughts and prayers as they could and should. And I'm just going to keep doing the same, my man. I hope they find a way to correct this somehow. I don't know too much about how those things work, and obviously I'm not prying or looking to find out or reveal anything that you don't want known by the public, of course. I'm just doing this segment so that we could get you as many thoughts and prayers as possible while you were on the road to hopefully recovering from this. Because, again, I, I just could not imagine what I would be feeling, thinking, if this were happening to me. I, I don't know what I'd do. So, I commend you for your strength, man, for even letting the world know about it, because that takes courage. This is really tough, to say the least. So, my utmost of thoughts and prayers are still with you, Spencer, as I'm sure everyone else who's listening are as well. And we wish you nothing but the best, my friend. I really wanted to just give you some love. You absolutely deserve it, not just because you are a loyal listener to this show, but also because you're just a really good friend and a really good person at heart. I mean, we know that just from just from interacting with you for years and just getting to know you. So it's just, I'm really sorry, man. And our thoughts and prayers are with you. We and I can only imagine how tough it is to do so. I know you're probably already surrounded by your family and all of your loved ones being given all the love and support as much as humanly possible. But no matter how tough it is to do so, please just stay strong, man. Stay strong. You got a lot of people supporting you. A lot of people will love you. And I wish you nothing but the best. Get well soon, man. I hope that they find a way to do something about this if they have not already. So all the best, Spencer. We love you, brother. And... I also wanted to say thank you so much to his wife who took the time to not only even read my message, relay it to Spencer, but also take the time to answer because I cannot imagine how many messages, how much feedback they're getting from all Spencer's followers and all the stuff they're reading out to him and letting him know how much love he's receiving, and I'm glad to hear about that. But to take the time to not only read my message amongst the hundreds or thousands they're probably getting but to also relay to Spencer and take the time to write me back too, it just, it means a lot. And it means even more to hear that even, again, amidst all of this, he listened to my show on Monday. That's, that renders me speechless. It really does. So hopefully we'll make this as fun a show as possible for you, Spencer, because I know if I know you well, buddy, you don't want me to concentrate on this for too long or get too negative. You're a very positive guy. So what do you say in honor of Spencer? We get into having a kick-ass Yapping Yankees episode today for 212, huh? Because there is a lot of good about today. Even though there were a lot of L's this week on spring training games. But hey, we do not care too much or at all about spring training results, right? Remember, it's exhibition. It might be tough to keep yourself grounded on that fact sometimes. Because it's very easy to get emotional. I myself am a very emotional and passionate person. People who know me well know this very well. But with spring training can't really get too far ahead of yourself. It's important to evaluate individual performances to a certain degree, but you don't want it to get too out of hand because, again, it does not count. And honestly, the players, depending on who they are, especially with pitchers, they are not trying their utmost. And they might be trying out new things they would not be sort of putting on a test trial in the regular season when it actually does count. So you got to keep that in mind a little bit. But there is one good thing, even outside of baseball, that I wanted to get into before we even start the actual show with the Yankees content itself today. Something very good about this day in particular, March the 10th. What could it be? Well, it could possibly be well, something very big happened in the middle of the night. And that is the fact, yeah, I had to know I was going to mention this because of how much I love the summer and how much closer it's getting to it and all the signs that lead up to it. Well, last night was a big sign. The clock's 
Jumped ahead an hour, which, yes, losing an hour always sucks. It throws people off for a couple days, maybe even myself for the first day. But, hey, what's the big news regarding this as far as positivity? Well, it is the fact that starting tonight and getting even better and better and better with each passing night heading all the way up to the summer solstice on June 21st, it will be starting to still be light out well past 7 o'clock at night. Hell yeah, give an applause for that. Definitely worthy of an applause, but that is so... I mean, it's one of my favorite things throughout the year. I know a lot of people are bothered by it because they lose the hour, but my God, how could you not be happy about having more sunlight? Jesus, how could you not be happy about that? Even right now as we speak, I'm doing this show in the early 6 o'clock hour this evening, or at least that's when I started recording, and it is still as bright as ever outside right now. Meanwhile, if this did not happen... Last night, it would be on its way to being almost pitch dark out already. And one of the most single miserable things in the world, in my opinion, is when it is pitch black out each night at like 4.30 around the time of the winter solstice. And you just turn the clocks back an hour. So yeah, you gain an hour. That's a positive. But oh my God, how early it gets dark. It's miserable. How could you possibly like that? How? Like, I see people complaining about losing the hour today, but my God, the positivity of having an extra hour of sunlight. Good Lord, how could you not love that? So I'm so happy about that. The clocks go forward. We lose an hour, yes, but yet another beautiful sign of better weather and conditions to come of the regular season being just around the corner and just for feeling more positive with having more sunlight deeper into the day. The clocks go ahead an hour and we get more sun. Hell yes. Definitely why it was worthy of an applause. We love when that happens. So that is a huge positive about today. And hey, another huge positive. And I know that I've started off basically every show with this the last few weeks since spring training started pretty much. But I can't help it if the dude wants to keep hitting home runs particularly on Sundays when it's conveniently time for another Yapping Yankees episode from one of his biggest fans. What am I talking about, you might be asking? Well, as I just said, same damn guy I've been playing clips of for weeks now. Courtesy of the Yes Network, here's a 447-foot gift for you. 30's dropping everything. Juan Soto, forget about it. Juan, gone. Just put the Yanks ahead. 7-6. to six. Fourth homer this spring. You had to know it was coming. You had to. Oh, Juan Soto again today. As you heard them say on the S Network, I believe it was Bob Lorenz. You'll have to forgive me if it wasn't. I listened to it only very briefly. Absolute bomb. Three feet short of 450, which is basically 450. I mean, come on. Just an absolute tank job to right center field. The people who were way back in the stands could only just look behind them. Oh my goodness, I don't want to be a hypocrite, I know, I was just saying before, spring training only matters so much, but I mean, all the hype and expectations surrounding Juan Soto, it's just a different story for him. I'm not relating it to what I expect him to do in the regular season, it's not getting me any more bummed out or excited than I already was, because I already know what to expect of Juan Soto. So spring training doesn't necessarily add to it, but damn, you'd be crazy if you told me that this is not fun to watch. This is what we've been waiting for ever since the second of that trade being announced. I just can't wait. I just get more and more hyped for games that actually count, seeing what Juan actually does in Yankee Stadium, and even in the road, Gray's on the road, I don't care. As long as the games count, I just cannot wait to see what Juan has in store for the 2024 season. My God, I cannot wait. And him in the offense, most days they still look fine. But uh, as I said before, there are quite a bit of losses, actually, this past week, strangely enough. Today was actually a really epic win, even though it was really starting to look like a loss before that three-run home run you just heard by Juan. But this past week was actually not great. (laughs) Still a good amount of runs scored each day. I mean, even if you want to go back to last Sunday when they lost to the Tigers next day, they only scored three runs but got the win against Miami. Then they lost a tough one against the Mets but still scored four. Lost one against the Rays the next day. Lost against the Tigers again the day after that, but they scored five. 
Lost one of the Blue Jays on Friday. Lost yesterday, scoring seven. Still lost, though, because they were down big before scoring a few. Later on in the game, losing 10-7. And today they put nine up on the board and actually getting the win. So, if they had lost today's game, they would only won once this past week. Again, spring training, you only give that so much of your attention or passion. But, still always nice to see that number on the left side of the record tick up a digit. Regardless. But seems to be a lot of panic around the Yankees community this past week because of the theme that I basically just mentioned. The fact that some of these games, they still scored a decent amount of runs. The offense really is rarely ever been dead at all this entire spring, maybe just a couple of days. But other than that, and yes, you can only give that so much credit too because the main starters... Not nearly all of them are in most of the games even, and then even when they are, they only play about half the game. Get three, maybe four at-bats, maybe. But usually about three. Some of them even just two, like Judge did today, when everybody was flipping out that he might have been hurt because maybe a slight wince that he had in his swing, and then he was taken out after just a second at-bat, while everybody else got three or four at-bats, but the Yankees confirmed after the game, thankfully, that everything is fine, and Judge just said that he was good after two at-bats. Hope that's the truth. But if it is, then he's just fine. But offense, still looking pretty good. And that is to be expected. I do expect big things from the offense this year, especially if everybody stays healthy, which as we know, again, is the number one priority, not only at all times, but especially throughout spring training when it doesn't even count. That's the main important thing. Just stay healthy. But there is one concern. That seems to be sweeping the community as of this past week. And it seems to be the starting rotation. Now, am I surprised by this? No. Not only because some people out there seem to overvalue spring training, but also because I myself have my own concerns with the starting rotation. Have for some time now since it's been more or less revealed that their moves for it to improve it basically ended at Stroman, at least for now, as of on March 10th. That could still change going forward if any of the, for some reason, still remaining free agents out there tend to change their minds and actually decide that they would like to be employed prior to the regular season. That would be a different story, and then the conversation would obviously change. But as of right now, Stroman is still the only starting rotation exterior addition the Yankees made this past winter. And ever since that realization, at least as of now, came about, I have had my concerns with the starting rotation. This doesn't really have much to do with what's happened in spring training so far. Obviously, some of what I've seen this past week obviously does not make me happy. (laughs) But it also does not make me too discouraged because, again, the games don't count. They're not even pitching in full games. Sometimes they're taken out of the game and they're put back in, like we saw with Garrett Cole in one of his starts. And we saw that again today with Clark Schmidt when he had a really rough start getting shelled in the first inning. But they're also, we know this about the pitchers. They might not be trying to the utmost of their ability, but also, even if they are, they could also be trying out other things that they ordinarily would not in the regular season when the games actually count. So that's why you could only have spring training performances hold a certain amount of water. That's why I always say, don't waste your time injecting too much passion into spring training. You could be as happy as a pig in crap that baseball is back in general, but To get too fired up about what you've seen in games that don't count, where people might not be trying their absolute utmost or might be trying out something that they wouldn't ordinarily usually try out in games that actually count, there's only so much that you could get passionate about that. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and breath. Or fingers if you're rage typing on Twitter or something. But anyway, it is a theme that we saw quite a bit this past week. Carlos Rodon looked shaky. Nestor got shelled. Schmidt did not have a great outing, at least in the first inning. When he came back out... In today's start, he seemed to shape up and do very well, but hey, you can't take a starter out and then put him back in in the regular season. But again, the game doesn't count. So again, you can keep throwing these points back and forth as to why you should be upset by what you saw today or this past week, why you shouldn't. You could go back and forth forever, I guess. My point is what I've already said. I'm not going to let it hold too much water, but I'm also not going to be too thrilled about it because I want to see these guys ramping up pretty well and getting ready and looking pretty sharp. Now, we have seen them look sharp at times, but this past week, the vast majority of it was not so much in that arena. So, we'll get to talking about that in a bit, and the social media segment may or may not have something to do with this subject. But we'll get to that. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it.
but definitely a lot to opine about there, especially considering a lot of that discussion centers around a lot of key pieces in the rotation that I feel they're going to be relying heavily on, and their success or failure will heavily hinge on these particular names. So, definitely a lot of interesting discussion there that we will continue to have in the social media segment, and probably as we go along in news, maybe a bit in the recap segment as well, when we go over some big moments that happened in this past week's game, some of the biggest takeaways. But for now... Let us move on to the next segment of the show because we are already about 20 minutes in because time just continues to fly as it always does. And I continue to yap away as I always do because your boy is fluent in Japanese, as I tend to say every now and again. So let us move on to Yankees news and talk about some of the things that happen with the squad, whether it be injury news, whether it be roster news, whether it be any more claiming off waivers and DFAing or any more reassigning to minor league camp or putting back down at AAA and shrinking that roster down up until the final product on opening day as spring training continues on and on until it eventually comes to a close, which it will be doing, believe it or not, already within the next two and a half weeks or so, which is absolutely crazy. (laughs) I feel like it just started and there's only about a couple of weeks left of it. It's just bonkers how fast it continues to go. Absolutely crazy. So with news, we start this past week on Tuesday the 5th. Monday was quiet on the forefront. Tuesday, some news came out that the Yankees actually already reassigned infielder Jeter Downs, infielder Caleb Durbin, outfielder Spencer Jones, as well as outfielder Brennan Lockridge to minor league camp. And they also did the same to Tanner Tully on Wednesday after two solid outings this spring prior to that, one starting and one relieving. He has since pitched again because it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't appear in spring training games, but they have been assigned to minor league camp as well, just as a sign that they're probably not going to make the uh, opening day roster, which I think none of us are surprised about when it comes to those names. But they still have the chance to appear in spring training games until the Yankees no longer want them to when it gets closer to opening day, so we'll see as time goes along there. But that's the official news on Jeter Downs, Caleb Durbin, Spencer Jones, and Brandon Lockridge. Also on Tuesday, some unfortunate news on the injury front, and this is unfortunately going to be what the rest of the news segment contains, because as far as the roster, not too much else happened. Only a few days also, and they also reassigned J.C. Escara and infielder T.J. Rumfield to minor league camp as well, and optioned catcher Augustine Ramirez to A Somerset, and that was just yesterday, so... Other than that, not too much roster stuff happening other than the continued shrinking of it as spring training continues on. But as far as some injury news going forward, some good, some bad. We'll start with the bad. Get it out of the way first, I guess. Especially because it really went in that order too, conveniently enough. But also on Tuesday, alongside that other roster news I told you about before, Aaron Boone told the media that Tommy Canely, as much as we love the guy and as entertaining as he is and as as lighthearted as he is and as crazy as he is, lovably crazy, not actually crazy crazy, but we know that he was tormented by some injury issues last year, and he has been for actually the better part of the last few years since he's really left the Yankees for the most part after his first stint with them years back. But unfortunately, it seems to be continuing a bit for him here, which is really unfortunate, especially considering when he did pitch out of the bullpen last year for the vast majority of the time, he was a great arm to have back out there. But unfortunately right now, in his spring training buildup, he is behind, and he may not be available for opening day. And it's really not good news as to why, but it turns out it's actually a result of the shoulder inflammation that ended Tommy Canely's season last fall at the very end. Now, we remember that bicep tendonitis, a lot of arm issues, kept him out for a chunk of the first half last year until he came back, was a great arm out of the bullpen yet again, as I said before, and then he went down again to end the season with some shoulder issues. Well, it's certainly not encouraging to hear that said shoulder issues are still being a bit persistent after a whole winter into the next spring. So, I don't know how severe it might still be or if it's... Not even there really at all, and it was just mainly throughout the winter, which caused him to be just generally behind, but he should still be good eventually. But, I mean, it says here, Boone said that he may not be available for opening day, so it's going to delay him at least a little bit. You hope that it's just 
little, very little, as little as possible, because when he's healthy, Kane leaves a good arm out there. You really can't deny that. Just look at the numbers. It's a statistical fact. So aside from how much I just love the guy personally and how entertaining and wild I think he is, I mean, he's a great arm to have, and you just don't want him to miss much time, if at all. But unfortunately, it seems like he might miss at least a little bit based off what Boone said. He has been throwing bullpens, but he won't be pitching in actual live games until it seems like the end of spring training. So he's going to need a little bit more time to ramp up in order to be fully ready for the regular season. So it sounds like he's just a little bit delayed right now. But certainly when it comes to problems that date back to last year, you don't like to hear that it's delaying anybody after this many months at any sort of capacity. It's just not a a great sign. So I hope that it's done after this and we just get Tommy to pitch basically the entire season once this is all said and done and hopefully can be put behind him. That's what you hope for. Now, speaking of shoulder problems, Peraza, Oswald Peraza, we've spoken about the fact that he has had injury troubles himself, a lot of them in the arm as well, even dating back to prior to this spring. But he's been having issues throughout the spring, too, as we know. They just don't seem to want to leave the kid alone, for the love of God. Still bothering him. And Boone basically had an update for the media earlier on that he was just still dealing with some issues and he was going to be submitted for further testing. They were going to do that that dye test where they try to get more detail in the imaging to see what truly is wrong and see if they could get a more specific read on what the injury really is and more specific timetable for when he could possibly return. Well, they did that, and after the test, it was unfortunately announced that on Thursday night, he would be shut down for six to eight weeks with a right shoulder strain. Far too young for this to be happening at all, and this is really a time where Oswald should be really fighting for spots on any sort of major league roster that he could get, whether it be the Yankees or elsewhere, and really just increasing his value, but just can't stop with the injuries. Can't stay on the field, not even this spring, and after the troubles he was having last year too. I mean, we were talking about briefly on last week's episode about where he he would even fit on this roster. Guys like him and Cabrera potentially fighting for spots. Well, whoever was fighting Peraza for a spot for opening day and beyond until he's ready to go. Uh, It's safe to say that they are basically guaranteed a spot, at least for opening day at this point, on the final roster, the final product. But, my God, it's just unfortunate that this kid, and the more he gets hurt, the more his value drops, and, you know, if the Yankees can't end up finding a spot for him, but he also can increase his value, it's um, not going to do very well for the day the Yankees possibly do decide to finally include him in some sort of a trade to get something back that they need in return. It's just not looking good, the whole Peraza situation. You hate to see injuries in general, especially to guys like that. I mean, he's so young. He should be flourishing right now in the field, just accumulating his value and just advancing himself in his young career, but he just can't get out of his own way with the injuries. It sucks. Absolutely sucks. And from a business perspective, if the Yankees have had or do still have any plan to trade him, well, him missing time on the field certainly does not help anything value-wise, as I said before. So, hope for a speedy recovery for the kid, obviously. Uh, Plays a really solid infield, much of anywhere you put him, really. Still has some developing to do with the bat, but uh, whether it be here or elsewhere in the future, I feel that there's a good chance of him doing that, because he does show a lot of promise every now and again. But uh, now he's got to get past this shoulder problem and just worry about getting activated before it's too late. Because as of right now, if it's a full eight-ish weeks, then you're looking at him not being back until at least mid-ish May. If you're even accounting for the time that it might take to rehab his way back to after missing that kind of time. So, I don't know. It's tough. So it would seem that Peraza is going to be missing the first month to month and a half of the 2024 season. And as I said before, too, whoever it was that was competing for him potentially for a roster spot, whether it be Cabrera or anybody else that somebody else or the Yankees themselves might have had in mind, well, seems like they may be getting that roster spot after all, not even for the sake of competition, just for the fact that uh, one of the factors was removed from the equation. So, And then really, all that's left to discuss, a couple of things. 
on Friday and today. This is where the good news of injury stuff comes in. We like to hear things like this. So I wanted to finish this off on a positive note, trying to keep it as positive as possible because we like to hear positivity when it comes to injuries because there is overwhelmingly negative information regarding injuries when it comes to the Yankees, obviously, usually at all times. But on Friday the 8th, just a couple of days ago, Mr. Boone also provided us with a Jason Dominguez update, which we are all obviously always down for hearing, especially when it's in the positive light. But he did confirm that Jason is already throwing from 75 feet and will begin hitting from both sides of the plate on Monday, which obviously is tomorrow from the time I'm currently taping. So that is really good to hear. If he's already going to be swinging from both sides of the plate, it is only March 11th as of tomorrow, guys. If he's already doing that, I know you got to be gentle with anyone post Tommy John, whether it be a pitcher or a position player, I know. But especially considering the fact that he is just a position player, I know you have to use your arm for long-distance throws and some real aggression out there sometimes when it comes to outfielding. But he also is not a pitcher. So if he's already hitting from both sides of the plate and throwing from 75 feet, which will probably increase in the coming days also, I don't know how this keeps him out until June. Another three months? I mean, maybe it does. I'm not a doctor. I'm not following his progression firsthand with the Yankees on the field, watching him every single day in his progress. So hell, I could be dead wrong. But if he's already progressed this far, beginning to mid-March, I don't know how this keeps him out until June or especially July, like some people were originally saying. They might have just been saying that to cover their behinds just, you know, because early on anything could happen. Before they start to work out again, it's really tough to get a good look on when they might return. So you just say as far down as possible, the complete maximum, just in case, and that might have been that. But I'm not even seeing how June is. I mean, I'm saying that he could possibly be back. Personal opinion, I'm not basing this off of any sort of a fact, just based off of how fast he seems to be moving in his progress. But I'm not taking it out of my mind that he could possibly be ready to go around Memorial Day. Is that ridiculous to say? I mean, that's still two and a half months away. I mean, it is just a couple of days before June. I'm saying, oh, not until June. That seems pretty ridiculous. But Memorial Day's hug in June. I think end of May isn't completely outrageous. Is it? I mean, if it is, let me know. But I don't think it's completely outrageous to say. Based off his progression so far. But I don't know. Seems to be going pretty quick, guys. So that's some really good news regarding Dominguez, and we spoke about on last week's show. Again, you'll have to forgive me for not remembering who threw this question my way, but somebody asked me what happens with the outfield once Jason returns, and I presented a bunch of different scenarios and probably even more that the Yankees might conjure up or have conjured up in the last few months upon possibly thinking about the exact same thing. But I already addressed that last week, but it's going to be really interesting to see what route they go down, because obviously with the addition of Verdugo and the fact that they do intend on Stanton, especially with the changes he made over the offseason, the much appreciated changes, at least on my behalf. If they plan on him having some outfield time, then things could get really interesting and how the Yankees finagle this with all the outfielders they have that could start every day on other teams or, you know, not even to mention the depth that they still have. I mean, Oswaldo Cabrera has some outfield depth. They got Pereira if he makes the roster. They have... Grisham, obviously, and they have the number of outfielders that they already have, Verdugo, Judge, Soto, Stanton, and Dominguez when he comes back. There's a lot of outfielders on this team, potential outfielders. So, it's going to be very interesting, but I love the progress that we are hearing about the Martian. Love to hear it. I hope he continues to progress on this track. Let's keep our fingers crossed for Memorial Day, guys. Even if some people think that for some reason that's absolutely absurd or ridiculous, and maybe I'm missing some sort of information here that would otherwise make me think differently, but I'm liking the progression so far. Let's just hope he gets back. I mean, Memorial Day would be awesome. Let's keep our fingers crossed for Memorial Day. And as far as finishing off Yankees news, when it comes to today, there was some nice news today. One of the guys who started off the spring delayed because of some issues that they came into spring training with, and we were saying, oh, for the love of God, what the hell? Why? Well, that seems to be coming to an end, especially because of something that did happen, but Jose Trevino 
return to game action as of today. First game this spring that he has played in. Nice to see him back, especially with all the catchers that we have been witness to this spring so far. The Yankees have a lot of catching depth in the minor league system, of course. And even now up here, it's between Austin Wells and Jose Trevino. Who's going to get playing time when? Is it going to be nearly even? Or is it going to depend on who they're facing on a given day? Might someone win the job definitively over the other and one will be a definitive backup? I mean, who the hell knows? We're going to have to see what happens, especially considering Trevino just got back today. But nonetheless, it is good to see the 31-year-old solid platinum glove defending Yankee catcher back in action today for the first time in 2024 spring training. And uh, actually, even from an offensive standpoint, not even just mentioning his defense, because he is not known for his offense as much outside of the first year that he was here, because in 2022, he even opened a lot of eyes offensively, which in his days in Texas, he tended to not do really much at all. It was mainly all defense. His entire Yankee tenure has featured great defense so far, with the exception of a few hiccups here and there. I mean, that's to be expected of any human being. Everyone makes mistakes, but not really known for his offense. However, today, in his first game back, well, he already did this. Low four ERA. Jose Trevino went down, scooped that one up high, long, and is it fair or foul? It's a fair ball. We'll base that on the crowd reaction. 8-6, Trevino, if that's his afternoon, that's a good way to end it. He scored last inning and singled, and this time a solo home run to make it 8-6. So the calf must be fine. <laughs> uh, bros had to go off the crowd reaction to determine whether or not that was a home run. <laughs> uh, either way, that's really good to hear that Trevino did that in his first game back, singled, and as they mentioned, scored in the first half bat, and then really went down and got this pitch to tag it for a home run. He golfed that. I mean, even let go with one hand, I believe, if I remember the clip correctly. So, I mean, listen, especially from the plate, that's a uh, good sign, I guess. Because he's not really known for his offense, but especially behind the plate. It's good to see him back. Him and his platinum glove elite defense. So, got some good news there to end Yankees news with. That's what we like to do. Between Dominguez's continued progression and really quick one at that, and Jose Trevino, one of the injuries that the Yankees seem to come into spring training with Barely before the workouts even got underway. Well, that seems to be behind him already. He has already returned and will hopefully be taking the rest of the spring, continuing to stay healthy from that calf problem he had coming in. And will be ready for opening day like almost everybody else. So that's really the Yankees news from this past week mainly, guys. Reassignments to minor league camp or optioning back down in the minors. When it comes to the roster, no more... Waiver claims and DFAing, really. The Groshans thing was the, was the last one. Out of all the waiver claiming and DFAing and then outrighting to the minor leagues off the major league roster, if nobody picks them up, well, Groshans was really that last one. Other than that, a lot of reassigning, a lot of optioning, and then obviously you have the injury news, both not so great, and ending off, fortunately, with some positives. And speaking of positives... Not too many of them when it comes to results this past week in the games, as I said before, but there were still some positive takeaways. We'll go through many of both when it comes to the biggest takeaways from this past week's games. We already went over last Sundays when we spoke last week, obviously, so we'll start with Monday. They were on the road against the Miami Marlins. Starting this game for the Yankees was Clark Schmidt, and as he had in the past... Looked pretty good, and uh, in this start, he looked phenomenal again. In today's start, not so much where he started again today on Sunday, but in this start on Monday six days ago, looked phenomenal. Four shutout innings, not allowing any walks, only one hit, only struck out one, but four innings of damn near perfect baseball from Schmidt on Monday, so definitely a good showing from Clark, no complaints there. As far as the offense is concerned, it was a low-scoring game until the very end. So the starters really did um, little to nothing. But the Yankees didn't really have too many of the big guns in there to begin with. Volpe and Glaber and Austin Wells were in there. But otherwise, Grisham, who's obviously expected to be depth. And then you also had Oswaldo Cabrera, Everson Pereira, Rojas, Van Meter. And then you also had Spencer Jones in there. But uh, And then obviously all the substitutions to follow, but not 
a huge chunk of the lineup are the regular starters, obviously, but not much offense at all till later on. It was one nothing Miami as of the sixth inning, no scoring before that. Then Carlos Narvaez tied the game at one at the top of the seventh on a bases loaded walk. Brandon Lockridge got a lot of hits like this this uh, spring, so it's really nice to see. Uh, two run signal to put them ahead three to one the Yankees, and uh, the final would be 3-2, to two, so the Yankees got their win in that game, and it'd be the only win aside from today's game that they actually got all week long, so Tuesday was a loss to the Mets, mainly thanks to an embarrassing moment, unfortunately, by Ben Rortvet. Uh, he's had a lot of people losing confidence in him, or, you know, while the two catchers are healthy, of course. You know, wanting people to not really want much anything to do with him as far as being on the Major League roster come the regular season, which, as long as Trevino and Wells are healthy, I'm pretty sure people will get their wish anyway. No real need for Rortvet at that point, unless an injury happens somewhere. But an embarrassing moment where he just dropped a pitch, and the ball got away from him, trickled behind him to the backstop, and he was just standing there like a guy standing in the middle of a crossroads, not knowing which direction to go, and just looking completely and utterly lost. And... Funny enough, Boone was in the middle of doing an interview on TV at the time, and he was even yelling, like, it's behind you! Like, it's a, it was an embarrassing moment. Ben just standing there completely lost, and everybody was pointing to where the ball was, and he was just standing there, and then he ran back to get it, and it was two runs came around to score while all that was going on. So it was an embarrassing moment for a Rort vet, and two crucial runs came home to score, considering the Yankees only lost by a run, so that was a difference maker, that happening. But, um... Otherwise, starting the game for the Yankees was Tanner Tully. Two scoreless innings for the young man, so nice to see. One hit and one walk and two strikeouts, no runs allowed. Until in the third inning, De Los Santos came in and it all just fell apart from there. Four runs, three earned. That was when the whole Rort Vet mess happened, so that was the unearned run portion. But nonetheless, the Mets jumped out five runs in the third inning and then... In the fifth inning, the Yankees managed to put up three runs on an RBI double by Jeter Downs and a two-run single by Trent Grisham, who continues to have a uh, fairly nice spring, getting some hits here and there, some big hits. And then in the top of the eighth, the Yankees managed to tack on one more on an RBI single by Kevin Smith, made it 5-4, and that was the final. The Mets got the W. So again, that Ben Rortvet mistake did cost them the game, you could say. Wednesday against the Rays, back at George M. Steinbrenner. Now, this one this is where the starting pitching concerns started to come in a little bit for Yankee fans everywhere, because starting this game was Mr. Carlos Rodon. And a lot of eyes were on him, because the Rays had a decent amount of their regular starters, particularly in the first half of the lineup in the game. And obviously, like myself, we're hoping to see Carlos build on some of the positives we'd seen in his first start or two this spring so far. Hoping to see him take another step forward. That, unfortunately, was not what took place. (laughs) At all, as a matter of fact. Because, and it was funny, because before the game, we saw him, like, going up to Anthony Rizzo and, like, yelling a lot, like, trying to get him hyped up. He seemed like his head was in the game, getting himself and his teammates all amped up. And then he goes out there, and the first pitch of the game was a bomb to Yandy Diaz. <laughs> so, first pitch of the game, Bro gives up a home run. So, not the ideal start for Carlos, no doubt about that. And then in the top of the fourth inning, when he was still in the game, he then gave up a two-run shot to Palacios. So, two bombs... One solo shot, one two-run shot given up by Rodon. And quite a few hits in between as well. Five hits in just three innings. He also walked someone, only struck out one guy in two home runs, three earned runs out of the three he gave up. So not a good outing for Carlos. Had a lot of people flipping out, which is not not a surprise because we all know that especially if this is the rotation the Yankees are sticking with. I said this a million times. I'll say it again because we all know I love to repeat myself. But... With this rotation set as is, we all know how much they're going to be relying on Carlos to be the man that they have paid him to be. And that is to be Garrett Cole's number two. Now, I'm not flipping out about this because it is just a spring training game, and I'm still believing in Carlos. I'm not going to back down from the prediction I made for him just a couple of weeks ago that easily. I'm at least going to wait until a few months into the game time that actually freaking counts before I make any determinations. 
Obviously, my patience will still be pretty low for him when the season starts, but it's going to take a while to completely shake my faith. But, yeah, certainly doesn't make me happy either, like I said in the intro. That's um, certainly not something I want to see. I do not want to see him having trouble with the long ball because Yankee Stadium, especially when it comes to being right down the right field line in particular, certain other areas, we all know that Yankee Stadium is not as hitter-friendly as some people may try to convince you it is, but especially down the right field line, it tends to be, and in most of right field overall. So, considering a, a, a portion of Yankee Stadium is pretty hitter-friendly, you don't want to see Carlos struggling with the long ball. So, I'm hoping this doesn't persist going forward, and he figures it out going forward, but uh, definitely not an ideal performance for Carlos, giving up those two two big home runs and uh, three runs inside of just three-plus innings. Not great. Uh, Velasquez also pitched, as did Luis Heal, eating up almost three innings. Uh, two and two-thirds, to be exact, only giving up two hits in one run, striking out three, so certain aspects of Heal still looked good. Just got to still learn to get some of that control and command back for the first time since Tommy John surgery, of course. He's on the road to figuring that out to the point where he will obviously, hopefully, ultimately become a depth piece for the pitching in case they ever happen to need him again. So, and after that, it was Nick Ramirez and Birdie came out to pitch again, had a nice performance himself, struck out two of the three hitters he faced. And when it comes to the offense, not really much happened. They couldn't really get into much until mid-game or so in the bottom of the fifth when the first run came home. But even this was on an error by Palacios at second on an Oswald Peraza hit in the infield. And then in the bottom of the sixth, Glaber managed to hit his first home run of the spring, an absolute tank job to left field. So that was nice to see Glaber going deep for the first time. So a solo shot made it 4-2. to two. And then Carlos Narvaez in the... Bottom of the eighth, hit a solo shot of his own to make it 4-3, to three, which would be the final, resulting in Tampa's victory. But uh, two legit runs on two solo shots for the Yankees off uh, Glaber and Narvaez's bats. But obviously, otherwise, the main story, everybody flipping out over Carlos Rodon's performance. And again, while I'm not flipping out over it, certainly not happy about it nonetheless. And Thursday... The Yankees were still at George M. Steinbrenner facing the Tigers again. They usually face them a bunch. Fellow Grapefruit League opponent. Got some familiar faces in this lineup again as far as the regular starters in the likes of Volpe, Grisham, Stanton, Austin Wells, even Pereira to a degree. And you had guys like Oscar Gonzalez, Rojas, and uh, Kevin Smith. You also did have Oswaldo Cabrera starting at second base. But nonetheless, the Yankees still lost this one big 11-5. Uh, Luke Weaver started this one, only went an inning and a third, allowing four hits, three runs, a walk, and two strikeouts. So Luke Weaver did not look too good. Neither did Anthony Masevich later on in the game, only pitching two-thirds of an inning. One of the runs he gave up was unearned, but still gave up three earned, four hits. Not ideal there. And uh, also at the very end... Yankees pitching-wise, Ryan Anderson, not really any major name to write home about, so not a big deal, but he ended up giving up three runs himself. So, Yankee pitching, particularly in the back end of the game, not ideal, but uh, Luke Weaver did not look great either. Ultimately, 11 runs given up, and the runs came off of the bats of Austin Wells and Everson Pereira, at least early on. The Yankees did jump out to an early lead despite the final score. Austin Wells, who is who looked really good this past week, uh, hit a ground rule two-run double in the bottom of the first. And uh, Pereira immediately followed that with a sack fly to make it 3-0. And then Austin Wells hit a home run as well in the bottom of the third to make it 4-3 to three Yankees at the time when the game was tied. So that was Wells' first home run in the spring as well, I should mention. So that's really nice to see. Then uh, throwing error made it tied up at four. Then the Tigers just friggin' took off from there. And uh, the only run scored from the Yankees at that point was Ramirez towards the end of the game at the bottom of the eighth with an RBI single to left field. Final again, 11-5. to five. So offense jumped out nicely in the beginning of the game, then died later on. Tigers scored a crap ton mainly off the later pitchers in the game. And that was the theme for Thursday. Friday, Yankees and Jays in Dunedin, Florida. And this one was very low scoring. 
As a matter of fact, the Yankees led it just one nothing until the later part of the game in the sixth inning. But the pitchers did a very nice job, specifically Marcus Stroman, with I believe his third start of the spring at this point. Very good to see. Didn't have a very good outing in his first, obviously, against Philly. Then his second outing, he bounced back very nicely, and it's pleasing to report that in his third outing, he continued on that great path because he gave four solid shutout innings in this game, only walking one, not even giving up any hits, obviously no runs, striking out two, had a couple of hard outs, but hey, it happens, it's still an out, but he looked really good in this game, so really good further step forward from Marcus Stroman after his kind of shaky first outing, but the last two, he has looked damn solid, (laughs) especially against his former team, the Blue Jays, it was some time ago he was a Blue Jay, but still former team. But uh, really good to see there. Clay Holmes also pitched after him. Pitched a dominant one-inning shutout. So nice to see. Uh, De Los Santos again. Crapped the bed a bit. (laughs) Responsible for the only two runs given up in the afternoon that were good enough to beat the Yankees. But uh, two-thirds of an inning. Two runs given up. Gilbert and Potit also pitched. All scoreless because Gilbert had to finish De Los Santos' inning and clean up his mess. And the final two innings, of course, shut out. And the one run did come off the bat of DJ LeMahieu in the top of the third inning, who had a nice game in this afternoon, going two for two with a walk as well, an RBI on that RBI double, of course. And uh, had a nice afternoon for what was otherwise a uh, bit of a slow spring training for him. I was talking about him a little bit in the Q&A segment, I believe it was, in last week's episode, about how out of all the regular starters, DJ is probably the one I'm the most concerned about because of his declining the last few years, and as well as, even though he he did finish off good in 2023, I always acknowledge that, so you have that to hang your hat on, and I love DJ, it's not for the sake of attacking him or the fact that I don't believe in him at all, I do believe in him, and I do very well think he could bounce back this year, even though age is obviously not on his side, time is not on his side, he's working against it, but there have been a few mechanics of his swing I feel like I have not liked very much this spring, but hey, looked good this afternoon, so, and he was the Yankees' only run, so... DJ, looking better this afternoon. Marcus, looked phenomenal again. Yankees lose a close one, 2-1. to one. Yesterday was a scoring barrage. The Yankees actually did jump out first, despite all that. In the top of the first inning on another home run by Austin Wells, a two-run bomb to right field. Driving in Anthony Volpe as well. So that made it 2 to nothing. But then after that, it got really chaotic. Twins jumped out in front, putting a run up in the first, four in the second. And then three more, one in the fourth, one in the fifth, one in the sixth, and then two more in the eighth. And the Yankees tacked on a few later on in the game in the seventh and eighth innings as well. Josh Van Meter hit his first home run of the spring. Christopher Familia also walked with the bases loaded. Everson Pereira got a two-run single as well, so that was good to see. And then the Twins tacked on more after that, obviously, to bring them to ten runs. But starting this game for the Yankees, most notably, and this got people on edge as well. And hey, what do you know? The two people that this is centered around, aside from Clark Schmidt's explosion today too, a lot of people's worry centering around the two main pieces that I've been saying for months now, that if this is more or less the rotation that they're going to settle with, then you're going to be majorly relying on these two, being Carlos Rodon, and who's the other one? Mr. Nestor Cortez. And uh, Nestor pitched in yesterday's game. And ironically enough, the two people that people are flipping the most out about this past week after their performances are Rodon and Nestor. Because Nestor got knocked around real good in yesterday's game, unfortunately. Three and a third, nine hits, six runs, one walk. And he did strike out six, so the strikeout numbers were good. But my God, otherwise, yike. So... Yeah, nine hits, not ideal, especially in the second inning. He really struggled. Um, Not good. (laughs) Not really ideal. And yeah, while he was struggling, an error by Luis Gonzalez. God, that name gives me trauma. But anyway, uh, throwing error by him certainly did not help much of anything. But nonetheless, really, really tough outing by Nestor here. Um, Again, similarly to Rodon, even though this was definitely worse than Rodon's outing. (laughs) There's no doubt about that, but... I am not going to let it get to me too much because Nestor has had his mix of good and bad this spring so far. 
But also, it, it is just spring training. But also, I'm not thrilled to see this. Certainly not. More or less just because of the basic fact of what I just mentioned before. Because you're majorly relying on him and Rodon. If this is, in fact, the rotation. That's who you're relying on, primarily. Obviously, Garrett Cole's the ace, but I'm just saying behind him as far as reinforcements because he can't do it by himself. You're relying on Rodon to be the number two behind Garrett Cole, who you paid for last offseason, obviously. It's number one. You're hoping Marcus Stroman comes here and contributes nicely, and two out of the three starts looks real sharp. And uh, hopefully he keeps the injuries at bay and looks more like his first half self last year as opposed to the second half. And then it's Nestor, really, who missed a ton of time last year as well, and even when he was was on the field, he was showed a lot of regression, unfortunately. And Schmidt being the number five as of now, well, I mean, you're just hoping he looks a lot like he did on Monday and not like today. <laughs> so, just the shakiness in the rotation leaves me uneasy. But again, these concerns existed even before spring training. So, yeah, not particularly thrilled to see outings like yesterday from one of the main guys you're majorly going to be relying on, but not going to flip out about it either. And offense yesterday, as I said, the main big thing was Austin Wells' home run. Everything else really came towards way later in the game, in the top of the seventh with Van Meter, and then in the top of the eighth with Familia and Pereira. As far as today, start with Clark Schmidt because I've mentioned him a few times but he did start today's game yet again. His main struggle really came in the first inning, and that was when he gave up four runs. Did not look pretty, and honestly, it had a mix of everything. Just uh, hits and walks and a wild pitch, and took him a while to even get one out. Pitch count was elevated, and then he still gave up a two-run single after that. Uh, just did not look good. And they pulled him in the first inning, as I said before, and then the Yankees ended up getting out of it. He came out for the second and part of the third and looked good after that. Started racking up the strikeouts to the final total of five. Not good, especially in the first inning mainly. But first inning and all innings included after that. Final line was two and two-thirds, four hits, four runs all earned two walks and 5Ks. So the 5Ks and the better part of the outing came later, and the struggles really were at first. So he had trouble getting into the game at the beginning. Gerber cleaned up his mess after he came in for him in the first. And uh, Victor Gonzalez came in after that, gave up two more runs. Marinaccio came in later in the game after Ferguson pitched a scoreless inning, gave up another run himself, who was shocked, not me. Tully came in at the end and gave up one more run as well in the ninth, but the Yankees were able to hold on thanks to the offense just exploding today, despite the Braves jumping out to that early lead because of Clark's struggles, but they really stormed on back. Bottom of the second, Alex Verdugo, RBI single, Jose Trevino, sacrifice fly on top of the single and home run he had on the afternoon, so again, Trevino just uh, had himself a hell of a day. In the top of the fourth, the Braves added on two more to make it 6-2, but the Yankees weren't done. DJ again, so he's starting to come through with some hits. I like that. Let's get going, DJ. Two-run single for him, scoring Verdugo and Trevino. Then, after that, the glorious clip I played before of Juan Soto hitting his fourth home run of the spring, a three-run go-ahead atom bomb, 447 feet to right center. And the Yankees' generational stud put them ahead 7-6. to six. Then Trevino hit his solo shot after that that I also played the clip of earlier. And after Oscar Gonzalez tacked on the ninth run in the bottom of the seventh on an RBI double scoring Van Meter, the final score was 9-8. to eight. So the Yankees got their second of only two Ws of this past week. So that was really the main takeaways this past week offensively, pitching-wise. That's really what happened. Going forward... For this coming week, as far as what to expect with the games, you have the Yankees actually having a split squad tomorrow. And there was news from my man Brian Hoke on Twitter that the road game, Juan Soto is going to be playing alongside a lot of the kids, so that should be interesting. They'll be on the road against Philadelphia at 105 Eastern tomorrow on Monday the 11th. And the other split squad will be at George M. Steinbrenner Field, the second game also at 105 Eastern against the Orioles, who, again... It's exhibition, so it doesn't mean anything record-wise, but uh, the Orioles are actually 14-2 and this spring. 
It's crazy. But that's who the Yankees are facing split squad-wise tomorrow. Orioles at home and Phillies on the road in Clearwater. And starting the games at George M. Steinbrenner Field, first off, it'll be Will Warren, who the Yankees obviously hope is a part of the pitching depth, alongside another man who they also hope for the same thing, pitching on the road against Philly in Clearwater, Mr. Clayton Beater, who I hope to see some more steps forward from after his last outing. Did seem to get wild at times, but it's got really good put-away stuff, and if he just has good control and command, well, he's going to mow down a lot of hitters. So... I hope to see some continued progress on that. That game should not be available on TV, but it would appear that the Orioles game tomorrow will be available on Yes. So, in case you want to tune in. Tuesday, the 12th, the Yankees at the Blue Jays in Dunedin again at 107 Eastern. No starting pitchers announced for that one as of right now. It'll be available on the Yes app if you have that to watch. Wednesday the 13th, the Yankees will be at George M. Steinbrenner Field facing the Boston Red Sox, which will be available on Yes and basically everywhere for the Red Sox as well on all of their radio and television stations. This one does not have starting pitchers announced either, but that's the deal on Wednesday the 13th. 105 Eastern at George M. Steinbrenner. Thursday the 14th, Yankees and Tigers yet again. On the road will the Yankees be in Lakeland, Florida. And no starting pitchers are announced for that as well. Not available to watch anywhere, unfortunately, so not televised. Thursday's game and Friday, March 15th, the Yankees return to George M. Steinbrenner Field for another night game. So the first night game of this week, it would appear, and there have been a good number of them, more than usual, as I said, for the last few weeks, when you compare it to past years and how many night games during spring training there were then. But on Friday, they'll return to George M. Steinbrenner Field to face the Pirates at 6.35 p.m. Eastern. And this game will be available on Yes, so you'll be able to watch it there. It'll also be on the radio, on the fan. So there you go there. Saturday, March 16th, the Yankees will be seeing the Blue Jays again, but this time at George M. Steinbrenner again. 105 Eastern, no starters announced. Game available on Yes and on the fan, on the radio. So, yet again, two days in a row with those conditions. And last but certainly not least, on Sunday when we will speak again, the Yankees will be facing the Red Sox once again, but this time at JetBlue Park in Fort Myers. No starters announced. It'll be available on TV and radio for the Red Sox, but not for the Yankees, unfortunately, at least as of now. But that'll be at 105 Eastern next Sunday when we speak again. So that's what's up ahead. If you want to tune into any Yankees spring training games, I know there are some people out there who don't care about spring training, but I do because after so many months of nothingness, I want to soak in as much baseball as I can get. But I will say this. I do usually say about a couple of weeks in that feeling of, my God, I just want the games that actually count to start up usually starts to creep up on me a little bit, and I'm starting to feel it a tad at this point. I hate to admit it, but I'm starting to get there. By next Sunday, I'll probably be there. Next Sunday, the 17th, about three-ish weeks in or so to spring games, I'll probably hit the point where I'm saying, let's get the games that count now. (laughs) So, I mean, we'll see, but I'm already starting to feel it creeping up on me a little bit. So I'm sure it'll be even more so by next Sunday. But if you want to tune into anything this next week, those are the conditions, watching or non-televised conditions, times of the games, pitchers, wherever available. And that's that, my friends. Last, but certainly not least, though, here on episode 212, we will finish, as we always do, with the social media segment for this week. As I alluded to before, I'm sure you could guess as to what the subject is for this week, especially since the title of the episode majorly hints to it as well, and because it's a big theme in this episode, because it's a lot of what people are feeling this past week, aside from the fact that we all love Juan Soto and hope that he stays here forever. But anyway, the other main thing is probably the fact that there are some early concerns, and it's majorly centering around the starting pitching, around two guys in particular, named Carlos Rodon and Nestor Cortez, given what happened with them in 2023. But it is an open-ended question, back to asking the questions this week, as opposed to last week's Q&A, which was a lot of fun as always. Thank you all for interacting with that as usual. But this week, an open-ended question. Whether or not it's based on what we've seen in spring training so far, how concerned are you about the starting rotation on a scale of 1 to 10? 
Now, it could be no change from before spring training, or you could be majorly delving into what spring training has shown you and getting even more concerned than you originally were, or you could have not had any concern before and still not have any. Regardless, despite spring training, or maybe even with it, whether or not it has anything to do with it, how concerned are you with the starting rotation for the Yankees? I'm not going to repeat myself much because I've mainly said it throughout the episode since it's a main theme of today's show of people unfortunately having some early concerns here before the season even gets underway because a lot of these concerns were existing before games even got underway here this spring. So, But I'm not going to put too much stock into spring training as I really never do because as I said before, particularly on this subject with pitchers, they often work on a lot of things that they otherwise wouldn't when games count. Sometimes they're not putting in their absolute 100%. They're just focused on ramping up and getting ready. Sometimes they do go out there one and have a really good outing. But especially in a pitcher like Carlos Rodon, for instance, who I just made a very bold prediction for a couple of weeks ago on the predictions episode, I'm not going to back down that easily. I made a solid prediction. I'm anticipating a bounce back from this year. If he doesn't bounce back, I'm obviously going to be very upset and very disappointed. But I can't be having my faith get shaken that easily because of one shaky spring training start. It's going to take a lot more than that to do that for me, especially with games actually ultimately counting at some point. That's really what it comes down to. But like I said before also, it certainly does not make me happy to see him or Nestor, two major names the Yankees are banking on for 2024, if this is the final rotation product, get absolutely shelled whether it counts or not. I'm not going to be thrilled to see that either. But I'm trying to stay calm about it. So I guess what I'm trying to say ultimately when it comes to rating my concern for it on a scale of 1 to 10 It's probably floating around a 6 or a 7 for me, but it has nothing to do with spring training. I will say that. So the part of the question where it says whether or not it's based on what we've seen in spring training so far, my rating has nothing to do with spring training. If I do put any stock into spring performances, it's it's next to nothing. It's still very little. So I'm not even sure it'd be enough to bump it up even one more digit, to be honest with you. So my answer personally based off of everything I've said now and throughout the rest of the episode prior to right now, I'd say my concerns are around a 6 or a 7, but really has nothing to do with spring training. It's been like that basically since they acquired Stroman, and the rotation has been set as is since then. So that's my answer. Let's read out a few of your answers, get the thoughts of some of you out there. Probably going to read about 10-ish, because we're already almost an hour and 10 in. It's crazy. I I just completely lose track of time every week. It's unbelievable how it doesn't only just happen sometimes. It happens literally every week to me. (laughs) Like Every week, I lose track of time while I just sit here and talk into this microphone to you guys. But let us start off with, let's see, at Vinman23 saying, anyone who has interacted with me at any point this offseason knows that I was at a 10 before spring training started, and I'm still at a 10. They need another starter. The offense can't carry them every game. I mean, yeah, man, you're absolutely right. That's unreasonable to ask of any offense, not just the Yankee offense, despite how good it may look, especially like 1 through 5 or 1 through 6, how killer it looks. It doesn't matter. Offenses are going to have their off days, and especially if injuries happen again, knock on wood, but especially if those happen again, you can't rely on them nearly as much. Not one aspect of any team can carry the entire season. It's just, it's an unreasonable and unfair ask and unrealistic. So yeah, you're absolutely right about that part. Uh, I agree that they need another starter. You know, I've been saying that for weeks on end now since they acquired Stroman, I was whatever about him at first, but even after that, I commended them for getting someone, but said the work should still not be done from this point going forward. I wouldn't necessarily say mine is at a 10, because I believe in Cole. I still believe that Rodon's going to bounce back, as nervous as he still makes me, nonetheless. I believe in Stroman. Nestor, I'm iffy about. And Schmidt, I guess he'll be fine. I mean, can't really expect too much out of him anyway. He's going to be the five guy. It's whatever. Uh, if you get an ERA out of him in like the mid to high threes, I would consider that a win, definitely. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily at a 10. I mean, a 10 is like you have virtually nobody. You still have Garrett Cole. 
Strowman's a respectable veteran. So I, I would. That's why I knocked that down in a couple of digits from ten. I'd say around a six or a seven's fair. Ten. I mean, that's that's like got nothing. <laughs> so that's what I take that as. But I definitely hear the part of you that really says that just because you're really concerned. Because, like I said, this rotation neither has the highest potential to majorly succeed and be one of the best, especially if Rodon is firing on all cylinders. Because then one through three especially has the chance to be really dominant. Or if it doesn't work out, because either Rodon and or Nestor just completely implode or spend a lot of time on the injured list and anybody else falls apart like Stroman underperforms or Schmidt craps the bed, like then you're looking at a real code red when it comes to the rotation. So it has the highest potential to be amongst the best, but it has the lowest potential to be an absolute train wreck. And that's nerve-wracking. It is, definitely. So, I definitely understand that. You need both of them firing off in order to be truly successful. At Baseball Tzar says, nobody is hurt yet, so 10. <laughs> God, it's so sad that we have all been just... We have almost been programmed to not even just expect, but at this point just anticipate the injuries because we almost know that they're going to happen. <laughs> We have been through so much trauma as far as injuries as a fan base. Us Yankee fans. It's been bad. <laughs> oh, gosh. Who's next? We got at Laura underscore Icemont, my good buddy Laura. She says, five. I'm still a little concerned about Rodon, but everyone else I feel pretty good about. Nestor's start wasn't pretty, but I know he'll bounce back quickly. Yeah, that start yesterday was uh, not not good. <laughs> A little over three innings and six runs given up, nine hits. Yeah, I wouldn't... I would definitely call that not pretty at the very least. But, yeah, hopefully he bounces back. We've seen a mix of good and bad from Nestor this spring, so... I mean, definitely once games start to count, you want more consistency than that. That's for sure. And in the direction of good, not the direction of bad. But Rodon has got to be where most of your concern lies because you're expecting a lot more of him even more so than Nestor because you're expecting Rodon to be the number two. At least as of how the rotation's set right now, currently. So, I definitely understand why the concern is there for him a bit more. I mean, we'll see, yeah. A five is pretty reasonable. I, I got mine up a digit or two more. But, still, I think five is okay. Next, we have got at Cashman Sucks NYY says, Spring training record doesn't mean much because most pitchers struggle in spring training. Well, it's a fair point, but I also did say whether or not it has to do with spring training. So, I mean, you could have still been concerned about it prior or, you know, have your opinion maintained all throughout like mine usually does because I only have spring training hold so much water for me personally. Some people take it seriously. I don't know why or how, depending on the, on the situation. But, yeah, you're certainly right about the part that, you know, pitchers do end up struggling a lot of the time. They don't always put necessarily 100% of the effort in because I certainly don't want to blow their arm out before games actually end up counting. And they're often experimenting with some of their stuff, maybe trying out something new entirely. So trying to add something new to the arsenal. So I totally agree there. At Yankee Ken says, three, spring training is not indicative of anything. It could be of some things, but yeah, for the most part, I, I definitely agree with that. As far as a three, I think that's a bit low. I'm definitely more concerned than a three, but when it comes to spring training, because again, it could be outside of that, because you could have still had the same concerns even outside of it. But yeah, as far as spring training itself, you can't let it hold too much water, if any at all. You really can't. It doesn't count. It's important to see some things, and you could definitely have fun when it comes to positive certain individual performances, like Juan Soto, for instance. So I don't, I don't want to be too much of a hypocrite, but even those, you can't look into the positives too much. You get really excited about it, but that could completely turn around come the regular season, and they could hit a bad slump and then have a horrible first month of the year. You never know. You just never know. So I'm inclined to mostly agree with that. At snob underscore of says, it's Cole and the Misfits. Thankfully, we have a pretty good offense to carry the load. Yeah, the offense is definitely my main point of confidence. I have been very strong in that point for a while now, so I definitely agree with that. 
But the rotation, yeah, despite their spring training performances, Rodon and Nestor from this past week in particular, it's concerning to me regardless. It still is. Not so much to the point where I'm saying 10, but I'm worried. (laughs) I'm a bit worried. I do still think that they need to get another person. Rebecca at Peace Now for Life says, Five, and Nestor and Rodon worry me the most. I'll wait to get really concerned after the season starts, but I'm really adamant that we need another starter and Nestor can move to the bullpen. So would it be Nestor or Schmidt to the bullpen for most of you? I'm actually curious to hear thoughts on that. I know I really would like... I'd like Clark Schmidt to take the steps forward to really cement himself into the starting rotation. I'd really like that, but... When Nestor's on the money, he's he's a really capable starter. So in the event that they do get another, I think that'd be a nice point of debate on to who should move to the bullpen. I guess some of it would depend, too, on how either one starts the season, how they perform. But it's actually an interesting rebuttal for that, I think. So if you want to let me know about that, uh, Rebecca or any of the rest of you, you're free to either comment on the video or, or the audio file, wherever you happen to be listening, or at me on social media and... Let me know, because that's actually, upon thinking about it, that would be, I think that would be a very good point of debate for whenever that were to arise in the event that the Yankees do add another starter, which I think we'd all be very happy about, because uh, we all acknowledge that they could use one. (laughs) At Crusaders, BBNY says six. That's about where I am, so that's fair. I agree. At Rebirth Chaos 09, my buddy James says four. I'm not concerned until I have to be. I know it's about getting off to a good start and whatnot, but look, spring training is to try new stuff out. If the Yankees pitching is bad in the regular season, we have a different story. Rather get it out now than later. Not worried at all. Yeah, when it comes to spring training, I'm inclined to agree. That's reasonable thoughts. I understand. But yeah, in general, the concern remains what it was before spring training for me. So I definitely, I hear you, James. All right. As we head up towards an hour and 20 minutes into the show, let's wrap up with the usual final two, as always. First up, my amazing girlfriend, Vic Salimo, says, Maybe a five. I said it before and I'll say it again. The starting pitching needs improvement. So far, I'm not that confident in the rotation, but I do know it's just spring training. But now's the time to get things down pat, so hopefully they end up doing so. Yeah, I mean, that's reasonable. You balance it with the fact that spring training only means so much. But also not be too confident. I'm around a 6 or a 7, so more or less, it's about the same. So, I understand it, babe. I do. And last but certainly not least, as always, is my amazing mother, Julie Gina Scudero, saying, I've been saying it all along. I'm not really feeling good about the rotation at all. Cole seems like our only real, reliable guy. And if that does play out that way, that's a problem. I hate to say it, but I don't like what I'm seeing from Nestor, especially yesterday. Seems unreliable and inconsistent. Maybe that dopey Snell will come around and accept our offer. (laughs) We need him, and he needs us. We are going to fail without getting better pitchers, and these are my thoughts. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you, Mom, but, uh, (laughs) Snell. Yeah, I I don't know what the guy's even waiting for at this point. There was a report on Twitter yesterday, and I even quote tweeted it because I couldn't help myself, and it was saying, oh, he has a strong desire to play for the Angels. I'm like, well, then go, bro. Just go. (laughs) We are less than three weeks away from the regular season, and you are still waiting out the market that Scott Boris clearly misread for you from jump. I don't know what you're waiting for, bro. Two and a half weeks, give or take, until opening day, and you still don't have a place to call home. Same thing for Jordan Montgomery. I don't know what guys like this are waiting for. We are well into spring training at this point in time. I don't get it. (laughs) I would say we need him more than he needs us, but I mean, yeah, he needs a job. So that he needs us side with each passing day does grow because from what I understand, unless this has changed and just hasn't been reported on yet, The only official offer made, from what I understand, is still the offer that the Yankees gave him weeks and weeks ago. So, yeah, you're not totally wrong at all, Mom. I mean, (laughs) we definitely need another starter. I don't want to pay him nearly as much as he has said that he wants. But if they're willing to lower the length of the deal and the money of the deal and he comes here for a decent price and 
despite him having his faults, if you still get a starter of his caliber with all those conditions considered, I mean, that's a huge win, but a lot has to happen for that to take place, and I just don't see it happening. But I'm really not sure what the goal is. He made that weird Instagram story post today where it was just a black screen with eyeballs as if, like, something else is about to happen, like, look out sort of a thing. But, I mean, we're going into the night of March 10th, and Mr. Snell is still unemployed, even though he just won the damn Cy Young Award. So, I I don't know exactly what he or any other free agents are waiting for exactly, but it would probably be in their best interest to find a place to call home and soon, because opening day is going to be here before we know it. So, yeah, I totally understand you there. It's really gotten dopey at this point, to the point where I'm just like, oh, if he wants to sign here or sign there, then just freaking go, bro. I'm tired of hearing about him. Tired of it. I'm tired of hearing about it. Just go. Go. Go wherever. If you come here, fantastic. If you go somewhere else, fantastic. Either way, we can stop hearing about it. Obviously, hope he comes here for the right price and right contract length. If that were to happen, then we'll talk all about it and give our thoughts on it. But yeah, that's basically where I'm at with Snell. Just the more days that pass, the less I understand what the goal is here. But yeah, you definitely need more than just Cole, as great as he is. Definitely need more than just that. Nestor certainly shown some inconsistencies. Rodon had a rough time last time out. Yep. But uh, yeah, they got to they got to figure out a way to get more consistent. I'm not putting too much stock into spring training, as I've said, but yeah, it would certainly be nice, though, nonetheless, to see a little bit more consistency. And, I mean, it's only been a handful of starts, so it's tough to judge even on that. But, yeah, the overall concern remains. I mean, I still, along with many others, I think it's safe to say, agree with the fact that the Yankees would be much better off adding another starter to the rotation. So with that being said, though, guys, that is all for the social media segment and therefore also episode 212. Thank you all so much for interacting with the social media segment and even just listening today as always. And as usual, I hope you guys had as enjoyable of a time listening as I did recording this show like I do every single Sunday. It's just a pleasure to be here with you every single week. I always have so much fun and I always can't wait to get to the next episode and Who knows what kind of fun awaits us the following week every week. That's what it's always about, isn't it? What joys or horrors await us. (laughs) I guess we'll see for next week for episode 213, right? But for now, in case you do not already, please do not forget to follow me on all social medias, guys. My Facebook fan page is Mike Scudero NY. My Twitter or X is at Mike Scudero. And my Instagram is at MikeScuds97. Subscribe to Yapping Yankees on all four of the platforms. It is available to listen on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And show your love across all four of them like you all always do such a great job at doing, guys. Subscribe, like, leave a comment, do whatever you gotta do. Show your love and spread the word. And if you have the time... If you have missed any of the past Yapping Yankees episodes, or if you just want to take a listen to a past one for the hell of it, not only would I greatly appreciate that, but where you could listen to them, well, I'll tell you. Episodes 34 up to episode 212 today are all available on YouTube, and every single Yapping Yankees episode from episode 1 all the way up to today, every episode that ever came out, those are all available on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. But once again... I thank you, 3000, for listening to me yap today. As always, my friends, I have been your host, Mike Scudero, and we shall yap again next Sunday, March 17th, when I come at you with episode 213 of Yapping Yankees, special St. Patrick's Day edition. It is St. Patrick's Day next Sunday. How about that? Got really important Sundays all around between two weekends ago when spring training finally got underway And then you have today, the clock's going forward. You got St. Patrick's Day next week, Palm Sunday the following Sunday, and then Easter Sunday the Sunday after that. So there's always a time where a lot of good stuff happens on Sundays, especially this year with St. Patrick's Day being on a Sunday as well that adds to it. I mean, Palm Sunday and Easter are always on Sunday, but also moving the clocks ahead, that always happens then too. But St. Patrick's Day adding to it, important Sunday after important Sunday after important Sunday. We love that. On top of the fact there's yapping Yankees, of course. Duh. But until then, until March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, as always, hang in there.
Be patient. Stay safe. Look out for your loved ones. Go ahead and kick life's ass this week, as always, my friends. And please, please, please do not forget to also keep our good pal Spencer once more in your thoughts and prayers. We love you, Spence. And otherwise, let's continue to enjoy the beauty of baseball as we creep ever closer to opening day, my friends. Make that just 18 days. The countdown has officially begun on Yapping Yankees. It's gotten so close to the point where I will start to mention that each week. 18 days until that chaotic opening weekend in Houston. God help us all. (laughs) All right. Talk to you next week, guys. Take care. And let's go, Yanks. Yanks.